Hello, everyone. Yeah, um, I'm going to uh, talk to you about a um, topic that's dear to me as a uh, musician. Um, that's called Hardware Aware Neural Architecture Search for Embedded Audio Effects um, Simulation. Um, I try to propose that um, approach of Hardware Aware Neural Architecture Search um, based on this application case, but I also hope that um, the idea gets clear that you can also use this for other applications. Um, yeah, let's jump right into the application case first. Audio effects. Um, audio effects, according to Wikipedia, <laughs> are um, electronic devices that alter the sound of a musical instrument or audio so uh, source through audio signal processing. So far, so good. Um, that means effects can alter the loudness, the timing, the pitch, um, the timbre, that means um, harmonic uh, content of the signal, um, spatial hearing perception, and so on and so forth. On the right-hand side, we see an example. Um, the top shows an audio signal as a waveform, and we are applying now um, low-frequency amplitude modulation um, with a frequency of 20 hertz. Um, which um, is applied by multiplication to that uh, signal um, and at its peak uh, multiplies the amplitude of the signal with two and at its value with zero. So we get an um, on and off swelling effect on that audio signal. Um, those can be implemented in analog or in digital. Um, analog implementations um, usually are implemented with uh, electromagnetics, that means, for example, um, tape. You could um, speed tape up, slow pe uh, tape down, flange it, and so on and so forth. Um, or electronically, that means via um, filters, um, nonlinear processing elements like diodes, transistors that generate harmonic uh, overtone content, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, let's look at a few examples. Um, there are a lot of different types of audio effects and you can categorize them very differently. Here is um, one kind of categorization from one of the reference books um, on digital audio effects. Um, that's a lot. I myself like to um, distinguish um, three different um, Characteristics, those are um, either we have linear audio effects or nonlinear audio effects. We have time invariant or time variant audio effects. That means um, they are directly dependent on time. For example, when you have a low frequency oscillator um, also in that effect, or they have short memory or long memory, whereas short usually means around a few milliseconds, long means more in the realm of seconds. Um, let's listen to some examples. I thought that may be a good idea to uh, give you a better understanding. So the first example is um, from a clean guitar. That means no effects, just for reference. And the next one is um, equalized. OK, you couldn't hear a lot. Maybe I can turn up the volume a little bit. Okay, it's um, make it 20. That should be sufficient, I hope. Okay, doesn't change a thing. Okay, equalizer. You at least hear the um, spectrum um, becomes different, a bit more bass, a bit more treble, um, which is linear time invariant and short memory. Now uh, let's listen to distortion. That should be significantly louder. Um, echo, you can't really hear the repetitions now, but it adds an echo, sorry for the volume, um, or flanger, which is a time variant effect. You might hear the swooshing in there. Okay, um, how can I remove, ah, it already is. Good. Um, this is how those effects may look like. This is my personal um, 
effect board as a uh, recording musician or as a um, audio engineer, you might have a lot of these boxes or you don't have any, um, but usually you have. And um, those are all analog. Um, and the issue with this is, um, so one, of course, um, it sounds good. We've been accustomed to these kinds of uh, sound processing for decades, and we love the nonlinear, uh, warm, and imperfect uh, sound characteristics. But this comes with um, downsides. So uh, this board is quite huge. You can't transport it as well, and it takes up space. Um, acquiring all these things can be very expensive, and they tend to be unreliable. So um, they are suspect to noise, um, interferences, um, impedance mismatches, um, all kinds of stuff. Sometimes even temperature changes when you have germanium di uh, diodes or transistors built into that. So what can we do about it? Um, usually people then um, try to implement these digitally. So instead of using analog technology, try to use digital technology. Um, that means um, you're using DSP, um, try to process the um, signal in the digital domain, that means with um, analog digital converters in front, uh, maybe you're doing a Fourier transform or applying FUR or IIR filters, so finite or infinite impulse response filters, and it gives you a lot more possibilities. Also because you're not bound to causality because um, analog implementable systems need to be causal. You cannot look into the future. It can only work with the uh, signal it gets at the current time and all past signals. Um, the issue with this though is that uh, traditional effects um, like distortion and so on and so forth, sound different than their analog counterparts when you implement them digitally and don't try to meticulously model um, the characteristics of that device. Um, so they tend to use, uh, they tend to sound too pristine, too clean, or too sterile, not really pleasant to the ears. Um, Attempting to model these characteristics is called virtual analog modeling, which has been a topic for quite some decades now. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see a um, tape echo simulation machine. Um, so this one tries to emulate the mechanical and electromagnetic characteristics of a tape machine, um, only in a very small uh, 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 form factor. Um, they do this by um, implementing the um, physics, the circuit, and everything um, they measured, and so on and so forth, um, and implemented this meticulously. This is called a white box approach. Um, ah, yeah, it's working. Um, so, what is white box modeling? What is gray box modeling? What is black box modeling? Um, white box modeling requires you to know the complete circuit um, that you want to model. So you need to know about every voltage and current relationships in the circuit. You need to trace circuits, run test signals through it, measure it. You need to know the um, circuit diagram. You also need to know that the circuit diagram is actually correct <laughs> um, because actually uh, some vintage or historical effects or synthesizers might not be implemented the way that the diagram says. So um, this is, oop, oh, I'm sorry. Can I get this back? Ah, there it is. <laughs> um, yeah, where was I? Uh, yeah, this takes time and is costly and um, you need to pay uh, very good expert engineers to uh, actually implement this. Um, in the middle, there is gray box modeling, which only requires you to know the circuit topology, but you um, have some free parameters that you um, try to fit on data. So um, either you run a grid search over it, um, or you um, learn um, parameters via machine learning. So you have like 
let's say, a compressor or a distortion. You roughly know how those devices are usually built, off, uh, built up, um, but you need to have some parameters that are specific to that one effect that you can then train on having input and output samples of that specific effect you're trying to model. And the black box approach on the right hand side tries to take this to the extreme. Ideally, you know nothing about the circuit and view it as a black box. And um, you completely learn the model by analyzing um, input signals that you feed into it and um, looking at the output signals and just trying to replicate that behavior of that device. So you're actually trying to imitate a complex nonlinear system um, just by looking at its output, right? Um, so this is a very simple diagram of this, uh, how this could look like. Um, on the left-hand side, we have our um, clean audio signal. Let's call it X. Um, and we run that through an effects box that implements a function, um, which we just call P. And um, this one's parameterized, for example, by knobs and switches. Um, and this one, hello, ah, yeah. um, produces an output signal, Y. But at the si same time, we also feed that into a neural network now um, and try to uh, replicate the behavior of G. So um, we have G hat, which is an approximator for G, um, which produces Y hat, which is a prediction of uh, how it could look, uh, yeah a prediction of the um, output of the actual hardware device on top, right? And usually we try to minimize that distance. So we try to get as close as possible to the actual output. Um, again, I have some sound samples, how this could look like. Um, those are some actuals I worked with. So left, clean guitar. A bit quiet again. Um, actual effect output. Doesn't sound pleasant, but that's how the effect sounds. <laughs> and uh, this is my uh, prediction. Which is close, but not perfect. As you might have heard, but can definitely see um, in the waveform. Okay, so what are my goals now? How, how to do this? How do we get there? Um, so I want to design black box models automatically for each specific effect. So. I cannot have a one-size-fits-all solution. People have attempted that. It doesn't really work, at least not for uh, my requirements, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and I want to do this automatically, because otherwise you'd need to design a neural network for each and every effect. And I want this to be a systematic approach. I don't want to do this manually all the time, right? Um, this defeats the black box model approach a bit, although people have called this black box modeling now for a decade or so. Okay. Um, also, because I'm, uh, I'm um, yeah, considering resource efficiency because I work at the Embedded Systems Department and want to implement this on actual hardware, um, I'm um, concerned with latency. Um, on the target hardware, and I want it to run with minimal latency so that I can actually use it during performance, for example. And it doesn't produce a sound one second after I hit a chord on the guitar, which is basically unplayable. And eventually, not there yet, but working on it, um, I'm trying to deploy models on a hardware platform that can instantiate arbitrary black box models with minimal latency. So I can have some kind of one box does it all approach. Okay, let's look at how we try to accomplish these. Okay, uh, the baseline architecture that I'm using as a reference um, is WaveNet based. So um, WaveNet is a fully probabilistic, autoregressive um, model for uh, generating raw audio data. And um, it is causal. That means it only uses the uh, present and past samples to generate the current output. Um, TCN 300C um, means temporal convolutional network. 
uh, the C stands for causal, and 300 is the so-called uh, receptive field of approximately 300 milliseconds. That means for every output that I produce, I look at 300 milliseconds of audio sample. Um, how are we doing this? Because when we try to do this with just linking 1D convolutions with each other, we'd either need to have very long kernels or we'd need to have a lot of layers. What we're doing is we're using, uh, we're using uh, dilations, so so-called dilated convolutions, or maybe somebody of you knows it under the name convolution a trois or uh, convolution with holes. Um, and I had a figure, but I needed to skip that slide, um, where you can see that in subsequent layers, um, there is just with a dilation factor of two, for example, only every second output of the um, previous layer considered for one calculation. But since it's shifted sample, at a, uh, sample by sample at a time, you still consider all samples and all outputs. But you're reducing the um, computational complexity significantly um, by still increasing the um, receptive field. Um, so they are also using uh, so-called parametric ReLU uh, functions, um, which is like a ReLU, but you learn the slope of x uh, low, uh, sl uh, smaller than zero. And um, yeah, here you can see um, the basic uh, configuration of that paper, which tried to um, model analog dynamic range compression with this, and this was a very, uh, um, yeah, the results were very good of that paper. And um, it was also the first model that was able to perform this calculation in real time. Um, and I'm using that as a um, baseline. What I did, though, is I removed the conditioning block, uh, which is faded out here, um, which tries to condition the effect on the parameter settings and switches, because the data set that I used uh, doesn't have those parameter informations currently. OK. Um, so, we could now try to use that model for every effect and be done with it. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Um, also, it's very slow. Um, it's still real-time capable, but um, the buffer that needs to be filled with those 300 milliseconds in the beginning, because otherwise you cannot produce the output, you'd need to completely differently implement that, which I will consider, but currently it's not possible, um, which increases the uh, initial time delay gap. And this is the thing that you hear as latency when you strum a chord. So we want to minimize that. Um, and so I want to develop one architecture that suffices these criteria for every effect. So if one needs a larger receptive field, then we'll give it a larger receptive field. If we can work with a, a shorter one, then we'll work with a shorter one. Right? When we need more layers, we take more layers. When we need less layers and it's an easy effect, then we'll take less layers. But I don't want to do this manually because I don't know how the effect works. Sometimes I do, but usually I don't. Uh, <laughs> And I want to determine this automatically. So, how to get there automatically? This is what I'm using hardware when your architecture search for. Mm. So, this is a very simple schematic of um, how this could work. So, you have an architecture search space that defines building blocks and rules on how to construct a neural network, and you have a search strategy that tries to find good architectures in that search space. Um, the search strategy might maintain a pool of candidate architectures that should be evaluated by the evaluation strategy. And eventually, we get a best architecture according to the evaluation strategy. And then we might make a final performance assessment of that. Um, the thing, though, is now the evaluation strategy um, cannot just consider accuracy metrics or something like that, but also hardware-dependent metrics, because the and also implement, uh, implementation-dependent uh, metrics, because the 
uh, inference latency um, is dependent on how fast the hardware platform can actually compute these results. Also, uh, we might want to consider in the future um, energy consumption. So this is very um, platform and implementation dependent. Um, so we're using, as I said, that model uh, or that architecture as baseline. And with the search strategy, we try to modify that by baseline by um, changing the uh, amount of layers or, or blocks, the TCM blocks, the kernel sizes um, or lengths, the number of channels per, um, per convolutional layer, the um, dilation factor, um, or using standard or depth-wise separable convolutions. Um, yeah. So this is what the actual implementation, the design, uh, then looks like. Um, I tried to uh, color it, uh, colorize it the same way as before, so you can match it to the components. Um, so the search algorithm I'm using is um, regularized evolution. So I'm using a revolutionary uh, evolutionary algorithm, and I'm initializing um, the search or the, the pool of candidate architectures with a random search in that um, architecture search space, which you can see here as a protocol, kind of, with um, building blocks and rules, so the set of options per layer, and the WaveNet or TCN structure built into that. Um, so, and after I did this um, random initialization, I start with a population in terms of uh, evolutionary algorithms of candidate architectures from which I, in each iteration, sample a random portion of 25% and then do um, latency measurements on my actual platform, which currently is, so the target platform in that scenario is also the development platform. Um, and the uh, loss estimation, which means I train it for a maximum uh, epoch count or do early stopping, at least for now. Um, and the fitness evaluation considers both of these. So the estimated loss and the uh, latency that was measured on that platform. Um, the worst model of that portion we discard and the best model we take and mutate. So we um, try to change um, some of these options for the layers. We have a certain mutation probability and uh, then we try to get the best model even better by mutating some of these. We add it to the population again, and then we iterate um, as many trial accounts as we have, so as many models we want to evaluate, and in the end, we get the best architecture. We train it completely then, um, and yield a final model. Okay. So. Um, I have some preliminary results. Um, those are preliminary because I've changed uh, a lot of stuff in the code but haven't been able to perform such comprehensive experiments uh, since then. Um, I think you can still see um, the potential of uh, this technology and um, at least some interesting uh, things to look at. Okay, um, the thing that I want you to focus on the most um, is on the left-hand side, we have the baseline model um, that I trained on each effect type, so a cabinet simulation, so speaker simulation, a distortion, a fuzz, an overdrive, chorus, flanger, phase, and tremolo, with the last four being time-variant effects as opposed to the others. Um, I measured the, uh, um, the loss, the um, loudness difference, the latency on that platform, um, and so on and so forth. And on the right-hand side, you can see the best model that I found with the hardware NAS algorithm. Um, on the right-hand side, and this is, I think, the most important thing, is the uh, relative, so, so the comparison between those two. And we can see that almost through the bank, we got faster a lot, um, relatively. Um, so with latencies now being um, 32 milliseconds, 60 milliseconds, um, here we got a bit slower, but it's only like two milliseconds. That is not much. And the loss is usually in the same ballpark, 
um, except for the distortion model, um, unfortunately, which is increased. But still, um, and this is the effect that you've heard in the sample before, it sounds quite alike, but not completely there. So this still sounds like the distortion device, just the loss is, in comparison to the baseline, increased. Um, the time variant effects look very good with very short latencies, um, but that is deceiving, and I'll show you why uh, on the next slide when we look at the architectures that the hardware NAS found. Um, again here, I think I want you to focus most on the right-hand side. Here you can see the receptive field of each architecture and the latency measured. Um, the receptive field is currently included in the latency measurement. So I haven't done sample by sample latency measurement yet, but rather, um, oh yeah, that I should have mentioned, the audio samples that I am processing are two seconds long. So I need two sec, uh, I need, for example here, 352 milliseconds to process two seconds of audio sample, which is real time capable. So I can run that on a device, uh, or on my laptop in this case, and it will produce um, the output before the next sample arrives. Um, and the thing that is uh, important to uh, increase, uh, decreasing the initial time delay gap, though, is the receptive field. And the baseline has a receptive field of 272 milliseconds, but for the capsim, the distortion, the fuzz, um, I got significantly lower values. So this will be way more usable to actually play um, by getting uh, very similar um, quality results. And um, the overdrive took a bit longer. Um, and as you know, the distortion uh, had not the best quality. And I attribute that to um, the search strategy being not explorative enough. So, um, I now changed or increased the mutation probability um, and also the trial count um, that we've used to get more exploration, the search space going, because it has like 1.2 billion architectures that are possible. And we cannot <laughs> iterate or evaluate them all, right? Um, but still, I think you, you can see a pattern. Um, the chorus, flanger, phaser, and tremolo, though, um, <laughs> are nonsense architectures. It was ne not able to, to really replicate that behavior. When you listen to the predicted, uh, predicted samples, it's basically the clean sound. So it didn't really manage to apply any processing at all because the architectural building blocks are not um, fit for this task. We'd need to introduce... Um, skip connections between the front and back end of the model and also um, probably make it directly dependent on time to be able to model that. Um, I'm working on that, that's fine. Um, for now, I know that this architecture is not fit to actually simulate this, which makes sense because the model that I'm applying is um, I'm approximating non-linearities in that black box model by yeah, um, using linear filters, the convolutional filters, and feeding it into static nonlinearities, which is not the execution model those time varying effects are based on. Of course, it doesn't work. I tried it out. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, this I essentially um, already told you now. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, I also, um, to get one step into the embedded <laughs> realm, um, use another evaluation platform with a um, not so performant processor, um, and also uh, used an optimized implementation of these TCN layers in C++. Um, and we're also able to get um, real-time performance on uh, that device. So with three models that I tested out, that was possible to do when I compiled them and put them on the uh, Raspberry Pi. Um, but I haven't done any elaborate um, experimentation uh, yet. Um, what I'm currently using this for is I want to, and this is where it gets tricky, um, 
measure the latency of a lot of architectures on that platform because when I'm in my um, search, in my NAS search, um, I cannot measure the latency of each and every model while I'm doing the search because that means I need to compile it, put it onto the platform, get the measurement, and then I can continue working. But that's not really possible. You have different um, methods you could do that. You could use uh, analytical models, lookup table models, and so on and so forth. But since I want to apply this to uh, different hardware platforms, um, I'm trying to go with predictive models. So I'm trying to build a data set with latency measurements and, um, yeah, then train a predictor on that. Okay, yeah, let's conclude. Um, current and future work, um, latency estimation, as I said. Um, there, uh, Lilith Berlayan has done some preliminary work for me uh, here from AUA. Um, she's uh, done her capstone project um, on development. Let me let me look. Uh, development and training of a deep learning approach to estimate latency of fully connected neural network inference. Um, and yeah, she did some preliminary work there for me, uh, which I can now uh, build upon. I supervised her work. Um, I also want to um, consider data set design again because um, it's suboptimal at the, uh, at the time. Yeah, I think I should not go into detail. Um, but also, and this is where it gets interesting, where it ties with the work of um, the rest of our group, um, I want to also add a hardware search space, which has layer templates um, optimized for our hardware platform. For example, the optimized depth-wise separable convolutions or an optimized LSTM when we want to work with that. Um, those I can parameterize and those parameters I can include into my search. Um, and this is what um, Lucas, which, uh, who isn't here today, and me are trying to work on. And um, this then leads to the yeah, integration with the Elastic AI Creator, which offers these templates um, to a developer, and in this case, the developer is the NAS. Um, and via this Elastic AI Creator, I want to deploy and validate these models found by the hardware NAS system with the predictions of the uh, latency on that platform. Um, I want to validate that on our target platform. On, it's FPGA based, as uh, the professor already said, and um, yeah, to validate, validate my approach. Okay, thanks for listening. <laughs> Questions? Hello. Uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation, it was great. Uh, I'm trying to remember all of the questions I had in my mind, but I can't. I just didn't have time to take notes. Uh, but I remember mainly three. First of all, since it's very familiar to stuff that I also work with. Oh. Uh, first of all, for the DSPs. Yes. I personally use them, and I turned from analog pedal boards to DSPs. Mm -hmm. they, they're pretty good nowadays, but... I can say probably they differ in the latency from a venue to another, mm -hmm. and uh, the quality is not at all the same if we compare to pedal boards, especially using tube uh, yeah. amplifiers maybe. Uh, so the first of all, I wanted to know, you mentioned about neural networks being used in the SPs or not yet? That's, that's one of the questions I need to know. Ah, okay. Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's interesting. So. Um, the thing that we are trying to do with the FPGAs mm -hmm. is trying to build a um, dedicated, optimized um, ASIC or, or an, an application-specific circuit which is reconfigurable. Right? So um, we're trying to implement a custom DSP for that specific effect you can think of right? by reconfiguring that um, field programmable gate array to um, implement that circuit. Kind of, right? Just digitally. Um, 
But um, I, I don't know which dimensions your, your question actually wants to tackle, but there's another thing that I find very interesting that people are now working on, um, which is called differentiable DSP. So you're taking um, actual um, DSP uh, functions or, or processing um, techniques um, that you're implementing in a way that they are differentiable, so you can optimize them with gradient descent. And then you're using um, tried and tested DSP, or, or not tested, but um, well-known DSP building blocks in your neural network as part of that, which I could include into the search, uh, search space, and then um, optimize its parameters to make it fit to the effect that I want to simulate. Does any of these two things answer your question? Uh, kind of does. It's, uh, it's still familiar with it, but uh, th this leads me to the second question, which is Very you good. said we use these models nowadays on effects and try to estimate both the quality and latency of them. Mm -hmm. uh, other than DSPs, can we use those on audio, uh, how can I say this, to some audio applications for recording with an audio interface and use the same models for the applications like Logic and Cubase and the others, not only for live music, but at the same time for live sound in general, or at the same time while recording? This is, is this also possible to be used? Um, to use DSPs for these kinds of neural network architectures? No, the other way. The, uh, to use these kind of models yeah. on software and not on DSPs, on software applications, ah. I mean. Okay. Um, yeah, you'd need, I think one needs to investigate those. So currently, um, we're working with FPGAs because it's interesting to our group. And we have DSP slices on there, which we can use for uh, some calculations, like filtering and so on and so forth. Currently, I've only considered um, DSP chips for very simple filtering in front of the signal, uh, for example, like a low-pass filter or anything like that. But um, it would be interesting to see whether we could implement something like that. So the, the neural network architecture that comes out of this, I mean, we don't need to learn on that DSP. We only need to deploy it. And basically, it's, it's cascading linear filters fed into nonlinearities. So I guess a DSP could be able to, to uh, implement that also. But currently, I don't have a clue on uh, how to um, implement this with, in terms of, for example, um, programming languages that are used for these kinds of systems. For example, Faust or whatever you're working with to run software on DSPs. Um, one could investigate that, yeah. But we're currently more interested into reconfigurable hardware, um, which we can um, customize to our own will with regards to circuits. Okay, makes sense. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. You're welcome. No more questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you.